It is time to bring in uh, Kaylor Hodges, talk about everything USL. Hello, Kaylor. Sorry, I was ranting about Canada soccer. As we all are. I, I was just like, seriously? Bruh? I mean, really? You're going after Mourinho and Lampard and uh, Marsh and Solskjaer on your budget? You're going to be paying them your entire budget. You ain't got no revenue out left. And so, yeah, anyway, I, like I said, it was, oh. Um, hi. Hey, it's good to know that Canada got the same response that we did when we reached out to Mourinho, uh, Jesse Marsh, and Lampard as well. So it's good to know that we're on evil, evil uh, playing fields. Uh, but there's more of a budget here south of the uh, south of the, the Peace Bridge, my friend. Uh, <laughs> as always, what we like to do is we like to bring you and the At USL show here on the last Thursday of the month as kind of a way to recap things, go over the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the good old GBU Look at uh, trendency, uh, tendencies and trends, not trendencies and tens, because then that would be something entirely different. But look at the mm -hmm. month that was inside a USL Championship, USL League One. But let me start with Open Cup and do something from like 30,000 feet a little bit. Sure. W when you look at the impact and the input that USL Championship and League One have had so far in Open Cup, what have been some of your observations and your friends at the at you at the USL show? Um, in terms of League One, because they've had more of an Open Cup run at this point, I think a lot of championship teams just saw that League One's not as far as they think it is. Um, I've been saying it for a while, but I think the gap is almost non-existent. Almost. Um, it's close. As for League One versus other Division Three you can tell by their record. I mean, League One, you can tell that they have been playing more matches. You can tell they're a little bit more mature. They were able to close out games, and they were able to get some late winners um, or get some late results. I mean, you saw the Spokane versus Las Vegas. And Andre Lewis, who's a longtime USL championship guy, decides to have a go from 30 yards away on, on the final kick of the game. Yeah. If he misses, the game ends. He's the worst teammate ever. But, you know, Spokane was in that game for a long time. And I think you see that that gap between USL League One and the rest of the Division Threes is pretty wide. And the gap between the USL League One and the championship is not that much. As for the championship, I feel like the teams that you thought would win did. I feel like the teams that you kind of put on upset alert got upset. And... I know that seems like really hard hitting analysis, but it does <laughs> kind of show that the gap is already there in the championship. Your haves and have nots are really showing why I think you're probably shaking your head and questioning your Rhode Island's, your Hartford's Hartford admin. Don't tweet before you play. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think those are the ones that you say, how did that happen? But if you also look at Rhode Island, they hadn't gotten a result until just last week. I mean, they gotten draws, but no wins. If right. you look at Hartford, it it was looking shaky at times anyway. So those weren't even entirely shocking results either. When you look at Rhode Island, I know that uh, you know first year club. I would I would think that you know that you're trying to balance an expectation with that of being a rookie and it's like you know you're trying to get guys to play together and you've had a training camp and hey you're going out there now as a first year club and so th those growing pains are there but you've been thrown into an open cup experience so you get this on the job training from a, a different aisle in the store so it, it's uh, it's an interesting mix for Rhode Island out of the block yeah, League One. I mean, when you look at their League One match or when they did the Open Cup match against Charlotte, guy like Jackson Lee. Jackson Lee came to Rhode Island to get experience. He was going to be an MLS2 guy, at best a starter in MLS2. Um, and he comes over to Rhode Island to be a GK2 with the senior squad. And Coke yeah. Vegas gets hurt, and he is thrust into first-team action with adults, which wouldn't have happened in MLS Next Pro. And he starts off hot, but then he gets it. He kind of gets it to him, you know, conceding four goals. A couple of those, you say that's a first year professional. And that's why 
it, it sucks, but that's why you do go to the championship. You go to League One right away as opposed to maybe Next Pro because playing against grown men, yeah. even if they are in the division below you, that is just a completely different animal than college or yeah. your you know academy leagues. And this is what we saw before uh, a lot of the MLS second team sides moved over to MLS Next Pro is that you had those matchups with uh, the second teams from Major League Soccer with young men, and I'm not kidding, 16, 17, 18 yeah. years old, going up against those adults that are twice your age. Now it's just more self-contained with it come, when it comes to these individual franchises. So it is young men getting first team minutes against other first teams. It's like first team versus first team. This is not first team versus second team. You're a 16, 17, 18 year old. You're being thrust into a situation right from the beginning. Yeah. And it's a good learning experience. And you know, there is, I'm one of the people don't shoot me, even though I'm on the USL show. <laughs> MLS next pro does have a place in this country. Yeah. And that was a thing that was a big uh, talking point a few weeks ago with with MLS Next Pro bad and people want to just get their shots in. It has a very important place in this country. You know, the first three letters is what scares people, but there is a point. There are academy leagues everywhere. The Premier League does it. The Bundesliga does it. Everywhere does it. It's a good place for those guys to learn. But if you want to be a professional, going to your league wins, your championships – that's a great place to get real world adult league experience. When it comes to coaching hot seats, mm -hmm. traditionally, where are you and your compatriots on the USL show before you sit there and you're going, okay, hot seat, hot seat, hot seat, hot seat. How much patience do you have when it comes to this particular topic on the show? Unless there is a scandal or it is just truly horribly awful and forget names on paper if they just look poorly coached i i think we all typically give a year year and a half let them get one full off season maybe two full off seasons to build their roster and then you go from there um which speaking of hot seat i think right now for us there's only one hot seat one true hot seat and that's brian Claire out out in el paso yeah. He's had two full off seasons and he's built the roster that he wants apparently. And it looks horrid, just absolutely abysmal. He is, you know, square peg, round hole, round square peg, you know, whatever it is. Yes, yes. Um, that is, that's what he's doing as I don't know if you can hear my cat just absolutely just raging havoc. So Nothing wrong with that brother. We got pets all over the place in our studio. Yeah. So just wanted to, it's like, what is going on? That's what's going on. That's all um, but Claire out. He's, I think the only one that's truly on our hot seat right now. How much does the early season schedule compression lend itself to the opinion because it was what three matches in the first week of the season alone for uh to, to get to, to get those matches in and they didn't get well they didn't do well out of the blocks and it hasn't uh, it's been compounded ever since because they're oh five and two in their first seven but three of those i think happened in the first week of the season well don't forget about the friendly that they put together and their open cup match i mean they so what they did I think they, if I remember the number right, and you know Phil can correct me later uh, right. from Seriously Loco, yeah. um, five matches in two weeks, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And that was a friendly that they organized right in the middle of the heart of their fixture congestion. They yeah. started off congested and just said, we'll put that in there. It was dumb. I think the biggest issue is not the results, it's how they're happening. Right. He is forcing this three back with Bolu Akinyode as a center back who is, if he's playing center mid, he is in the conversation of the best holding midfielder in the league. And I will go ahead and say, if he is playing holding mid, he's the best one. I don't think it gets better besides maybe Aaron Malloy, but those are 1A, 1B to me. He's playing him at center back because he is so just hell-bent on – playing a five of the back system when if you were to change the system to a four two three one a four three three maybe copy and paste exactly what Hartford's doing and put it on El Paso mm -hmm. 
I think that team goes from losing late to winning big. I think that's all he has to change, but he just has a refusal to do it. That's why I think the hot seat exists. Forget the results. Results happen, right? Like sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes you're just out of form. But when you force your roster into something that's not built for it, despite building the roster yourself, that's when you get on the hot seat. And sometimes it rains. Uh, That first week, Hartford beats you 1-0. You draw Monterey Bay, and then you only lose to lose City 1-0. And that was your first week. You had those. It was it was three results, and you lose by a total of two goals. Then you lose to Vegas, and Vegas in itself is another story where when you bring in a Joey Bats as an owner, and I guess he, he is rubbing off on, on Vegas so far with what they're able to do. New Mexico in your derby beat you 3-2. Then you draw with Tampa Bay. So it's it's like it, it it's a mixed bag here. It's like when your defense is locked in, you get the results like you did against Lou City even though you lose 1-0 and then you draw Tampa Bay 1-1, but then you end up in a derby and it's a five goal it's a five goal crazy pants match where it's 3-2. It's like you're getting it's almost like the HAL 9000 here from a 2001 a Space Odyssey. You're getting conflicting instructions here. Well, the thing is, is that they live and die by the wing back. Like they want their wing backs to just basically be wingers, which is great, except they're not really living by the wing back. They're just dying there. Ah. And, you know, those matches where it works and you're getting all the goals, well, they're still not getting back. At this point, I think you have to say, sit, sit back and let your attackers do work because they have good players and they're still waiting on Joaquin Rivas to get back yeah. and fully be healthy. But it just, it just doesn't seem like the roster that was signed was what they had envisioned, or maybe they just envisioned different players. And then when they got there, it was something else. Um, You talk about the Tampa Bay game. It takes a 75 yard attempt Mm -hmm. to get the draw. I mean, and I've went on a rant about this Jordan Farr, (laughs) And I see, I see Harry Austin in the chat Um, that not on Jordan Farr. Why are you expecting someone from behind the halfway line from a diagonal angle to shoot 99 times out of 100, maybe more? They That's not even on target. And past that, it's normally not even going to get over the keeper's head. But it takes a absolute wonder goal up there for best goal in franchise history for you to get a draw. That's not the sign of a good team. Okay. Uh, what about Colorado Springs out of the blocks at 05 and one in their first six? No hot seat there. That one's hard for me because I I don't know if that was really the roster that they wanted to have. And I, I know some people were bullish on them coming into the season. I don't know why (laughs) I, I, there's players that you like. You like certain players on there. Right. But it, it just doesn't look good to me. John's uh, John Morrissey's latest USL Tactics show, which you can check out on our Twitter or the top of our shows. Um, on the there USL you show. go. Get the plug yeah. in. Nicely done. Um, he did it on Colorado Springs. And it looks like they might have turned a corner tactically, mm-hmm. but turning a corner tactically was getting a draw not a win, a draw, and it still looked anemic at times. I I don't think it's a hot seat, but, you know, maybe that changes a little bit later into this season if they don't show any more improvement. Somebody might have flicked the switch on the the uh, the uh, heat, the heat seat warmers uh, on the driver's side. Uh, one more team on a hot seat, maybe, maybe not. Not a Miami FC, but the Miami FC. We got to see them go up against South Georgia Tormenta in Open Cup. And it has been an adventure for the Miami FC in their first seven matches. Only one win in uh, USL Championship so far. And it seems like uh, Nocherino cannot settle on a keeper. It seems like the the offense is there, but things through the first seven don't seem to be working well in uh, in, uh, uh, Boca Raton. Considering the fact that they were unanimously picked to be the last place team in our 
uh, fan votes, which got over 150 votes from USL championship teams. And they were the unanimous 150 people all wow. said that they would be the worst. I like, <laughs> you know, I, that said Miami, they, they went cheap because when they spent a lot of money, they were bang average. And now they are saving a lot of money. And when they're when they are clicking, it looks pretty good. That's the thing. At the start of the year, they were really showing signs. They were really showing that they could be decent. Now, title contenders, no. Playoff team, maybe. But I think they've already shown more potential than anybody gave them credit for. And if they continue just being awful, that is maybe you talk about it, but they were built to be cheap. They were built to be affordable. They were built to just kind of bridge the gap. And I think that's what happened. That said, on the goalkeeper thing, I think what you're looking at is just you don't, I don't think they really know what they want in terms of style. Because mm-hmm. Indai, he seems like a guy who, Whenever I watched him, he doesn't seem as comfortable with dealing with the ball at his feet, more specifically pressure. Um, And maybe that's what they want is just a little bit more of a ball playing goalkeeper. But, you know, those are truly hard to come by. And so I think you kind of have to deal with it. I like Indai. I think he had a howler, obviously, against Legion this last weekend. But even then, I don't really think that was as much of a howler because – it, he lost his footing, but if you saw, there was another play that I posted by Legion's goalkeeper Romero, where at the same, it was the same exact ball played. He let Romero, the 17 year old, let it come in a little bit deeper. He decided to take on and have a proper challenge, but even then, he misread the ball when it hit the ground. So something tells me that on the ground there is like a divot somewhere or there's an extra slick spot uh-huh. because at the same time that the ball hit that exact same pot spot for both players, they both misread it. Oh, wow. And and I decided to attack it head <laughs> on. Meanwhile, <laughs> Romero let it come in a little bit deeper. So Romero had more time to react to whatever's wrong with the pitch there. Meanwhile, and I just had to deal with it. And uh, so, well, looking at the Miami FC, it will be the it, it'll be the the co- the uh, color your own adventure uh, coloring book so far in USL Championship. Uh, As for the Tormenta side, that just want to say it real fast. Yeah. A team who has never lost to a championship team in open cup match, it's no longer a cup set. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't I don't think there is a single team in the championship. <laughs> who can go into playing Tormenta in the Open Cup and say they feel even okay? I mean, I listen. I know eventually Dell is going to get in here, Ben's going to get in here, and they're going to hear me say this. But Tormenta should be, or Charleston should be, a little scared. I understand that Charleston is an absolute wagon and is one of the top two, three teams in the championship. Right. But U.S. Open Cup Tormenta is just another monster. I mean, it, it literally is one and done. You you sit there and you look at film and you make sure that you know what's going on. But yeah, it's going to be fun with Ian Cameron and Ben Pierman uh, in the next round. Now that in the in the Alonzo division, uh, let's uh, go from the uh, the the questionable parts to the the successful stuff. We'll go from the bad and the ugly to the good here. As uh, Kaylor Hodges from uh, at the USL Show on Twitter is hanging out with us as as he always does for the last Thursday of the month. The West is the standard shootout that we know it to be. Right now, you've got five teams separated by three points at the quarter pole. Sacramento, Monterey Bay, New Mexico United, San Antonio, and Harry's uh, whoop whooping on that. And then our friends at the, the O&B uh, soccer cast, they're happy as well because they're at 12 points. So five teams within three points at the quarter pole. And then in the East, Charleston off and running. No real surprise. Once again, 18 points in their first eight matches. Loose City and Detroit City, three points behind, and the only other two teams that have double-digit points, Tampa Bay and the Birmingham Legion at the home of uh, at Kaylor Hodges and at the USL show. So of these races that we're seeing so far, the West, yeah, the West is the West, and they ain't wasting no time. Yeah, the yeah. West, I mean, I think you're looking at New Mexico United, and you know what? Greg Hurst, he is showing who he was back in Omaha, and I said it on this last show. I knew that Greg Hurst was 
a lot better than he has been in previous years on his first goal of the season. He takes a touch around the keeper and he spills it a little bit. It was a bit of a heavy touch. It looked a little clunky. These last two years that Greg Hurst would have squared it right at the defender that was in net or would have put it straight into the side netting. He tucks it away very well. Mm -hmm. And that was what we saw when he was back at Union Omaha. Alex Tambakis has been on my chopping block of I can't stand watching him for a couple years now. And he's shut, <laughs> and he's shutting me up. He is playing the best that he has in years. Yeah. And you know, in order for any team to win a championship, you have to have somebody click. And no better person than your star striker and your goalkeeper. Huh? Mm -hmm. I mean, like sometimes that's all you need. And New Mexico is really impressing me. Monterey Bay, as we talked about this. If you look at names on paper, it looks like they downgraded from last year. But if you look at the way that they're playing, just in just improvements to personnel on the field, this is such a better team than last year. And having your Alex Dixon and your Tristan Traeger on the same pitch is – disgustingly good <laughs> and having somebody feed those players is great i think that they are showing what i kind of hope they would be last year for sacramento they are still just a wagon um they showed against orange county just this last week when they decide to wake up a little bit to have one more cup of coffee that day that you just can't touch them yeah because yeah. it looked like all year that they just were disinterested uh -huh. and then they play the team that beat them off a goalie goal or they drew with on a goalie goal. And you can tell that they came out 16 seconds in Rodrigo Lopez, which the week that he had for him to get the, to get the assist 16 seconds in just beautiful soccer stuff, but also just Sacramento wasn't losing. And you could tell that early on is like, Oh, whenever they just decide we're not losing, they can do that. I mean, Sacramento, it's, it seems to me that Sacramento is just one of the, the, the regulars of the USL championship. And it doesn't matter what the offseason uh, off transactions are. They have, they have a core, they have a philosophy, and they bring folks in that will embrace that philosophy and that approach instead of bringing in someone that might be you know, more star power and try to fit them into a system. It is folks that will fit into that system and you make the collective better. It's a very Borg-like way of going about things in Sacramento and you're seeing the results right now at the top of the West. I mean, Trevor Trevor Amon is... He scored like 500 goals last year in League One. Oh, true. And that came from Arthur Rogers, who still looks really, really good with FC Tulsa right now. But Trevor Amon has two Arthur Rogers on both sides with... Like your whatever fullback pairing you want to go with in Sacramento, you have two of them, and they are a death by a thousand crosses, <laughs> and that's hard, especially when you're dealing with a league who you have a lot of young goalkeepers playing right now. A young goalkeeper getting used to having bodies in the box and having to go in and catch a ball, you know, get a claim in the box. That's that's terrifying. And even so, even if you deal with it, 30 crosses in, the 31st comes in, you're a little bit unmarked, and it's a free header to whomever's in the box. They are a death by a thousand crosses, and it works. And Trevor Amon is just built for that. And you know that uh, Eamon Zayed really could use uh, Trevor right now with Hailstorm in USL League One. One other question before you go, mm -hmm. and it has to do with the uh, the Jägermeister Cup. And, and I want glory. And I wanted to know what you thought about uh, this particular element of play this year inside USL League One. I know that there is hope that over time it will expand and it will be a US an, an overarching USL element where it's championship and League One chasing after the uh, the, the Jägermeister Cup. Where uh, uh, you know I, Jägermeister apparently they they they're diving in in full. What what do you think about this idea? of this cup specifically this year inside league one, but hopefully expanding over time to include both of the, both of the leagues. 
I love it. Even if it were to just stay in League One, we saw with the NBA that it can be super successful. I mean, it's something a little bit different. It's something that a club can market a little extra hard, right? They can sit there and say, say it's a club well, match. Like this is a cup match. They can come in. There will be a winner because there are no draws. You can, they ends in a penalty shootout. You want to see something entertaining? It ends in a shootout. You can market the crap out of that to your fans. So I think that's a plus. And I also think that if we see players truly buy into that this is another competition as opposed to just a 34-week slog, that this is something that they can get up a little extra for. And I understand that professional athletes get up for every match the same, but we all know that's also kind of not true. If it's a little extra special, it's extra special for fan, for coach, for player. I think it's great. I think that getting a club or like a sponsor like Jägermeister, that while the branding of a shot at glory is hilarious, that's a major brand. Yeah, That is a major your brand that if you've been out to party as a college kid one time you are very well accustomed to like yes. unfortunately um yeah. and so i think it's great if the the championship sees that this is a good product and the championship sees that it gets the league one side of this a little bit extra pumped up i think they can also do that on the championship side as well um, and marketing the fact that there are no losers that, or there are no like ties, like yeah. there somebody has to win, somebody has to lose. I think that's something that if you're trying to bring a new fan in, yeah. that's going to help a lot. Cause what's the one of the things that you hear about soccer? How can it end in a tie? It's How boring. There? Yeah, it's boring. How can you end in a tie? That's the worst. This can't, this is the best way to market to new fans. And I think that's great. Nobody scored. It's boring. Uh, cut the promo for me. What's going on with the uh, at the USL show? Uh, we are back to uh, for the glove of the game recording that in a couple of hours. Actually, we are being joined by a league one keeper. I'll keep it that vague, but um, you saw him with one of the open cup matches that we discussed. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, just more stuff uh, coming out. Kit season also records tonight and the main show Tuesday night, 9 a, or 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or hopefully or as early as possible the next morning you'll be on your podcast players. So check it all out. What he said, at Kaylor Hodges, at the USL show. It's great to always have Kaylor to talk about things in championship in League One. Uh, keep, keep us all posted on everything. We'll catch up with you soon, my friend. As always, great to have you here. Thank you for having me. There we go. It's Kaylor. Kaylor's going to go chase his cat now and uh, try and figure out where the the cat is raising all kinds of hell and uh, give it its own scratching post. I think it's probably going to need one of those three foot, you know, three story scratching posts to kind of climb. So he's not chewing up the sofa. So uh, I, I, we need a report. We need a report on at the USL show about Kaylor's cat spelled with two K's and how he's chewing up everything in Kaylor's pad. Now to figure out how, how not to happen. And you can't declaw the cat because that's just not fair because then he can't climb any kind of things, you know. He can't raise his own his or her own hell if he's declawed. You just have to understand it. That's just a part of the cat. 